So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to talking to you today. Um, again, unfortunately, uh, from lockdown, um, but really talking about the importance of a digital open science infrastructure. So I think with COVID-19, what we've really uh, seen is how important open science has been to support those looking for a COVID-19 vaccine or treatment. And they've really made good use of some of the service that we've helped build and promote like bio, um, bio archive or med archive. But what it's also done is it's shone a light on our dependence on others to get access to publications and data that's not yet OA. And whilst researchers are increasingly um, providing access to their material, which is really focus on cultural change. I think it's very much up to us to ensure that we have a really sustainable community governed infrastructure now and for the times of times ahead for other crises going forward. So this saw need for immediate access to information. There were so many calls to action uh, from governments, from charities, from libraries, consortia, all around, around the world to provide immediate access to publications and research data, calling on publishers to bring down paywalls. And they have indeed generously, temporarily uh, opened up a lot of that material, uh, thousands uh, of records to publications. We've also seen new systems like the CORD19 data set, which also brings together a lot of that material um, from around the world um, to aid access to uh, essential content for our researchers. Um, but how much of that content is going to uh, be available going forward? We know that COVID-19 is certainly not going away probably this year and may never completely go away. So although temporary access uh, to information is being provided, although some of this is open access content from this data set, for example, but a lot of this uh, does not have open licenses assigned to it. We don't know whether things can be reused. It, some of it cannot be. And it's also only temporary access um, for a certain amount of time. So I think you'll probably agree with me is we really need to have a system in place, providing open access to information for when we need it, for all those who need it. This is what we also said in our blog post at, at the time, it's important that we don't go back to business as usual once COVID is, or the, the biggest uh, problems of COVID are behind us, because we really need to have an infrastructure and a publishing system that works for us where we're not dependent on the generosity of some publishers temporarily providing us access to content. So this is uh, the healthy open science infrastructure I'd like to see, where you see a healthy soil, you see obviously certain pockets really thriving with life. It's all integrated, it's working together. But actually, in practice, it's still rather fragmented. There are some really healthy and financially healthy infrastructures that we see in front of us here on this uh, image. But not, of all, not all of it is working together, working on, with open standards, open source, uh, uh, using open source to enable others to work and, and uh, integrate with those systems. They're not all financially healthy. And we want everybody to benefit from this healthy landscape and not just in the times of urgent need. And as Anna just said, also, we want that open science benefits everyone equally. So what are the risks to this open science climate? So we've seen a lot of great uh, uh, development of services and infrastructure over the last 20 years, but many of those have started out as projects in our institutions. We've but some of us have been behind some of those. They've been funded temporarily, so through development funds. 
And now some of those are sustained locally by the research community through in-kind contributions through libraries. And funders, as I say, they've, uh, they've generously donated to innovation, um, but far less in operations. And I think this is a challenge that we have. There's some really essential infrastructure now that many of us depend upon. Um, what about the operations? Who is looking after the operational costs of those infrastructures? And there are risks. Some of those who've pro proven their worth over time uh, are landing on unstable footing, or at least they know in the next two or three years they're going to have to change their business or financial models. Will they have to join some of the larger publishers and then come behind paywalls? Will they have to downsize or even close? That's not a future that we want. And as Anna also said, what we really need, we need more diversity and equity in this scholarly co communication system. So what we wanted to find out last year, uh, we did a survey on European open science infrastructure. What does it look like? How healthy is it before we can recommend on what needs to be done? I'm just going to give a few slides on that. So if I talk about infrastructure um, on the left, you'll see we're talking about uh, aggregation and indexing services, search services, storage identity and persistent identifiers. And this graph really shows when we asked uh, infrastructures who were regional, national or international infrastructures in Europe, who do you depend upon? Who do you operate with? You, you can see the importance of identity and persistent identifiers and some critical nodes of infrastructure here, which are the larger blobs. And I will look at some of those. Um, but I think what's important here is uh, which of these essential infrastructures are actually community driven, how are they governed and how are they fin financially uh, sustained? Are they healthy or not? And what are they doing uh, to become sustainable? And what's our role in that? So this was the survey and the report can be found here. I'll share, we'll share the slides later, um, funded by the Open Society Foundations. So what, what are the, the key expenses for infrastructures if we're thinking about um, sustaining them in the future? Of course, salaries and benefits are the most, uh, uh, the highest cost. Travel and meetings, obviously they've fallen away in the last year. Um, then only comes equipment, uh, interestingly enough, marketing and then communications. Most run on two to five FTE, but half of those depend very much on volunteers. We also see this in the o OA diamond sector, so also in the publishing sector. Uh, look out for news on that new OA diamond study coming out, which we're al also involved in. But just back to here, so volunteers and the commitment of our academic institutions in this is absolutely crit critical to uphold open science infrastructure. The main sources of income are national government grants, so national governments being really key uh, to uphold this system, uh, in-kind contributions through our academic institutions, for example. And then there are other uh, new revenue models like membership fees, um, where uh, our institutions are invited to help fund those operational costs. Sometimes it's not even the cost of a of an APC that's being asked. And that's really important to help um, sustain some of those services. We also asked what were the most important sources of income. Uh, so still national government uh, came first and then you see some of the other familiar ones I've just mentioned, but the European Commission was mentioned second. Now that worries me in as much that if you're talking about operations, um, we also asked about the financial health of the open science infrastructures. Um, and uh, we see in the top bar, not-for-profit is dark blue and, and RPOs, research performing organizations like universities is light blue. Their operational deficits are covered by grants or sponsored projects. That's not a situation that we want to be in. So uh, as we know, there's always a lot of competition. It's not an uns it's not a stable way of um, uh, uh, not a stable income uh, to support the operations of important open science infrastructure. But many are really using that as a as a uh, 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 um, to support them going forward. 
we also asked without grants, how long would you remain viable? So fortunately, the majority said that more than a year, uh, but we still saw a number of, and larger infrastructures these are, less than a year, less than six months, or even less than a month. And that's really concerning. So that means that we as a community need to step up and also help support the operations of those infrastructures. And if we don't take concerted action, and if we also don't make sure that these stay in the community's hands, community governed, we are going to lose touch with our researchers and the open science community if it falls in the hands of others. We also lose control over the infrastructure that we've helped create, so what a waste. And we've seen with COVID how important flexibility is. We don't want to have further lock-in. We neither want our services to be compromised when certain infrastructures disappear or uh, come behind paywalls. And it will also mean that all the policy that um, Anna was talking about we need infrastructure to implement this policy and to reach our open access targets. So we need to shape our future by also making sure that some of this infrastructure is really community uh, led. So I'm going to um, touch on a few examples of how a certain infrastructure is being governed and is being financed and how you can contribute to that and how we can create a more sustainable open science infrastructure uh, in the future. So GenBank, of course, has been a key, a, a government funded and led um, service uh, for the coronavirus sequences. So fortunately, we had some of these things already in place. I already talked about BioArchive and MedArchive. Uh, they are at home at a not a non-profit research institution, a very old one at that. They have a very long history of science communications. So we have confidence that they're not going to be going away soon and that they're in safe hands, um, largely funded through the institution and with uh, grant funding. Um, in uh, looking uh, at Europe, we can be very thankful for the... Um, the European Strategy Forum for uh, Research Infrastructures, where member states really fund essential research uh, infrastructures. And of course, the COVID-19 data portal, this is an example of a new, uh, new portal that was created to serve the, uh, the research, co research community, an excellent use case for EOSC. And EOSC being a really, key um, and innovative infrastructure in the making. It now has an, an association uh, where you can contribute, um, you have a voice also to shape um, how it will be sustained and how it will also, how you can participate in, uh, uh, in the EOSC. Meaning that what's really important is who can participate? Who can contribute content to EOSC? What are the service provide providers? Under what conditions? How do we find a balance between um, providing open access to research material and innovating and supporting the market on the other hand, who are also partly responsible for sustaining EOSC into the future? So EOSC has, and the European Commission and the member states, they have put many, many millions into developing EOSC over the years. But now we're in a, we're in a, a situation uh, of how are we going to sustain this system? How are we going to feed that content? But how, how are we going to fund that? Uh, so you can have a voice by joining the EOSC Association. It's really important that this is community driven because it's such an important interconnecting infrastructure. So just coming back to uh, that visual um, on um, key open science infrastructure nodes, um, I'm just going to uh, run through a few examples of different uh, business models and governance structures so that we can see that we can have confidence in uh, some good practices. So, of course, some of the good practices, they've been around for a long time, like DOAJ uh, since 2003. They're very de dependent on supporters who provide annual fees to help 
uh, support their work. So that's uh, institutions across the globe. You can see that on that slide. And they also have a three tiered sponsorship system for uh, publishers and other larger uh, institutions and uh, also have grant funding, but that's a minor um, income stream. Um, all those who do contribute financially uh, are now, since a couple of years, um, also uh, invited to uh, nomin be nominated uh, on the DOAJ Council or the DOAJ Advisory Board. So you can also have a say if you contribute however small amount you can contribute to the say of the future of DOAJ. Uh, and they also partly introduced this uh, due to their engagement with us at SCOS. Now, Crossref is even older. Uh, they have a membership model as well with an annual fee going up from $275. Uh, but what's I think really interesting here, they also have the Crossref sponsoring organizations where organizations can help those who may not be able to afford uh, the $275. They may be an OA Diamond small journal um, that can't uh, get those DOIs that they really uh, want and need. And that's where Crossref sponsoring organizations can come in uh, and support those. So I really like that model. Uh, and at the same time, you're paying forward and supporting Cross Crossref as well as others. Uh, um, and their governance, you can see they have, I looked at their board uh, representation. It's split between companies, societies, other not-for-profits, universities and libraries. Uh, and they have also various committees. Of course, the, um, the first step is to have good representation. And the second step is to see how well it works and to ensure that everybody has a voice and uh, that those voices are balanced in the decision-making process. I think what we'll also see more of in the future is different is a mixed uh, funding model. If we look at archive again, that's been around for a while, based at a university where they get cash sub subsidy for operations and then they get in kind contributions for indirect costs. Some of that is matched by a private foundation, uh, and then they also call on membership fees, which are really important as well to fill those gaps and donations, as well as grants. We've also got very interesting uh, developments where funders are clubbing together to look at what are the key biodata resources that they depend upon and how are they going to ensure and perhaps earmark some of their budgets to ensure that that data and those infrastructures are not going away anytime soon. So that's a very interesting development, has been under development for a few years now, but I think we will also be seeing more funders uh, committing to infrastructure. And then of course, we've also got very interesting and new infrastructures like the OA switchboard, um, taking lessons learned from some of the good practices that I've already mentioned. Some of the demands that we have also as funders ourselves, also as institutions funding, we want transparency. So they have, uh, they will have a transparent pricing model. They've done a lot of research into funding models, exploring uh, different models in the future. And they've also set some sustainability principles so that we can trust in how they uh, are going to be managed and funded going forward. That's a not-for-profit foundation and has also some very good systems in place to make sure it's community owned and governed. So I think those are also really good examples to look out for and to replicate. And then of course, you've also got the question, well, how, how do I choose who to fund if I want to fund and help some of these and to support some of those uh, infrastructures? SCOS is one example. So SCOS is um, backed by a, a very large consortium of university libraries, and we're trying to help sustain not-for-profit open science services, alerting the funding needs to uh, the global community. And we vet those services. We get applications every year. Uh, we also insist that they follow good governance uh, uh, practices uh, and that they further development develop their funding models. And at the moment, we are uh, calling on um, the community to contribute to DOAJ, Sherpa Romeo, PKP, DOAB, uh, OAPEN and Open Citations. They all really need 
small amounts of support, not even an APC worth. Um, so it all contributes and all helps. Yes. Oh, I'm sure you have. I would like to just run through a couple more slides, if I may. Okay, then. Excellent. I'm nearly there. So, so what, what needs to be done? How can everyone contribute to creating a more sustainable open science infrastructure? So as owners and leaders of open science infrastructure and those in, involved in those, you really need to promote good governance, as I say, and engage in uh, those uh, uh, those uh, services, serve on those boards, make sure that the community is, is served. Make sure that what you're working on and what you fund is really connecting with the opens, that they are using open standards, open source and following open principles. Didn't have time to talk about that. one of those things today. And it's important to continue to support operations and development. Many of us are. But if you're not yet supporting operations, do consider funding in small ways uh, some of those membership schemes, schemes that I've talked about today, for example, or donations. And experiment with new funding me mechanisms like the Leuven um, Fair Open Access Fund is a really interesting one, or the new Amsterdam Open, Ac uh, sorry, uh, Open Access Diamond Fund. Um, and I think what's also key, and which we haven't talked about enough, um, is we really need to help build capacity to sustain this system. We need to collaborate more, share expertise and upskill uh, to innovate and save costs in this area because, that, because of this fragmentation on good governance, on open content and standards and on financial sustainability, because these are the pain points we know also from our survey. And we need to showcase good practices. We surveyed a number of um, important uh, services to us and looked at how different their sustainability journeys are share those and then work together with others, with existing partnerships, with IOI, with OPERAs, Fair as Fair and others, and establish new communities of practice that go beyond projects. So those I think are the ways forward to create a really open and diverse infrastructure that's more community led and connected and sustainable. Thank you very much. And now I look forward to your questions much Vanessa fantastic presentation yes infrastructure funding absolutely very important themes to help open science along for the future we have a few questions I'm going to tell our organization team we're running a little bit late I'm going to say we finished at, at 1205 that means we'll only have a 10 minute break if there's any problems let me know in the chat room and we'll just go ahead straight to the questions Vanessa do you see any danger of commercial providers taking over certain crucial parts of OS infrastructure? So um, we know that there are a number of large commercial um, publishers, uh, data providers that are diversifying their portfolios because they know that open access publications, that's the way to go forward. So how can they um, um, extend their offering to the research community. And a lot of these uh, exciting projects, infrastructures are being born at our institutions. So if they don't keep within, within our communities funded by us, the danger is there. We have seen it uh, buying up Chris systems developed uh, by um, not mentioning particular names, but repositories, Chris systems, um, um, various services and infrastructures. So the danger is there, and that's why we can step up to help prevent that. And also build that into your governance, yes, when you're developing things, and also when you decide on the legal structure of uh, that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It can also prevent you from being bought by some of those larger entities in some cases. Good points, good points. Next question, what could trigger a more long-term funding by governments and RFOs instead of project-based funding. Sorry, could you say, repeat that? I didn't hear the first part. Sure, I apologize. 
What could trigger a more long-term funding by governments and RFOs instead of project-based funding? Well, so, I mean, the first thing is uh, raising awareness, uh, which I've been doing today. Um, so really raising awareness of uh, what we've been investing in, uh, how important it is and how, um, how, how important it is to connect and to uh, encourage the, the open uh, standards, open source, open collaboration. Um, seeing that um, funders and governments have been uh, investing in this and to continue um, to build on that value and that they help then uh, think with us forward to see how we can, how they can help contribute to the further sustainability. Um, so I think there are a number of different models and we've been looking at some of this um, for the Open Access Diamond project. So that's coming out in the next few weeks. We've, we've got some recommendations there for Coalition S and other funders on how they could, um, uh, in the long, medium and short term, contribute uh, to innovation and to funding operations. So it's really, you know, uh, in its infancy, but they are really pricking up their ears, uh, many funders now, uh, research funders, so not just the institutions, but governments also thinking with us uh, on, on how to sustain. That information you said is coming out in a few weeks. Where can people find that information? Right. Um, yes, good one. Oh, it will, we haven't... Won't be public uh, yet? So, so, so we will certainly, uh, it's being run, this project is run by the Opera's group. It will certainly be on the Opera's website. We will be tweeting about it. Coalition S will be. So, you know, um, all being well, fingers crossed, in the next two to three weeks uh, on the OA Diamond study, there'll be some interesting uh, examples in there. Um, but still, there, there needs to be a, a lot more creativity and engagement and discussion between funders to see what... Uh, what might work, because we don't have those systems in place uh, necessarily yet that we need. Super. Our time is running out. I'm going to give one last question. I'm always fighting for the questions as a journalist, but I'll ask you to make the answer brief. Making science freely available isn't enough if only scientists can easily understand it. So we need open access infrastructure, but also incentives for research to communicate their science in plain language. Are these being considered together? Yes, yes. I'm not sure how that, um, how I can contribute more to that. I think that's, a, I think it's a really important statement and, um, and infrastructures can also help support uh, that goal, of course, as well.